I don't know how to describe it other than like like a demon type of sound. But it's silhouetted, hulking, every bit of five and a half feet wide, 13 to 14 foot tall, pitch black. The one thing that ran through my mind when I had this encounter was I don't have a big enough gun. Your host, two-time witness and field researcher for more than 40 years, William Jevnik. Welcome to Creek Devil. Hello, everyone. Welcome to the Q&A. Tom, would you like to make an announcement? Absolutely. I want to thank all of our new Patreons that just joined us within the last couple of weeks. And uh, so we'll be sending out some emails. Uh, just welcome aboard and uh, much appreciated. And if you want to support the show in that respect, you can do so if you watch us on YouTube. Uh, just go to the description and there's a link to Patreon. Or you can just go to Patreon forward slash Creek Devil. For as little as a dollar a month, you can you can be a, a, a supporter. and It's a big help. Uh, another thing that costs you zero dollars and zero cents is click like and subscribe if you haven't done so already. And uh, with that said, I'm going to hand the mic back to Will. All right. Um, well, let's go ahead and get started then, Tom. What do we have for questions today? Okay. Uh, Brian wants to know if Bigfoot was marking his territory uh, by urinating on trees, etc. If someone was to put ammonia to cover the smell, would that be a deterrent or taken as a challenge? Well, I'll start and we'll go around the table. Um, I was told that, you know, whatever you can utilize that's a stronger odor than what they're doing uh, is a way of establishing dominance. So if it's happening on your property, you want to mark the boundary of your property as yours. Forrest, what do you think? Well, I know that ammonia is a deterrent to raccoons. Um. <clears throat> However, my feelings are, and I think Chuck has had a little experience with this, um, I think that being that <laughs> they're primates and they're utilizing marking their territory, that they might take offense to that. So you might get into the proverbial, pardon the expression, pissing match. Um, <clears throat> so... Um, I don't know. I mean, uh, I, I, I guess maybe I need to go outside and reason with my guys and my hairy men that uh, hang around here and hairy women and, uh, and see how they feel about that. You know, we could do a on the street, uh, you know, <laughs> investigative report. I do an, an on the street interview? <laughs> no, I'm not going to do that. I'm not going to do that. I was being facetious. I am not going to do that. And, and if you... And if you think taking the water I water spray bottle, yeah, if you think if you think taking the spray <laughs> the spray yeah. bottle full of water out after him, that's not a good idea. Chuck, what do you think? <laughs> oh, I think it would be uh, it would be a challenge. Uh, I think uh, they they wouldn't like it, and I, I think you'd be uh, be asking for trouble. Is what I think. Tracy, how about you? <clears throat> I agree with Chuck. I say let them pee. You know, <laughs> let them do what they want to do. Oh, uh, David, how about you? What are your thoughts? What? The only thing I've ever heard of that will deter them as far as that is bleach. I've never really heard much about ammonia, but unless you've got a camera set up out there to watch their reaction, I don't know how they would take it. Tom, how about you? Well... Um, I apologize. I got the window open and I got the neighbor's dog barking. I but thought we had another participant. I'm going to be the odd answering. man out. <laughs> yes, I thought, absolutely. I the dog was voicing his opinion. <laughs> <laughs> right? He does that a lot. Um, good neighbors, though. Um, so my opinion is I'm all in favor of showing them who the boss is. Okay. Um See, he agrees yep, with he me. He agrees. <laughs> <laughs> right. Uh, I, I would say uh, either bleach or ammonia. And um, 
I don't know. I, I think they would probably, you know, they might, uh, it might escalate. Uh, I don't think you're going to, if you're playing the long game, I don't think it's going to be deterrent. That's just my, my opinion. Hey, Tom, I think we're going to need some software for subtitles for the dog so people can understand what's going on behind you. <laughs> really? Right? <laughs> Okay. He definitely has an opinion on them, man. Apparently so. <laughs> <laughs> what do we have next? Okay. So next, um, and this is from Danny. And Danny, I want to thank you for getting a hold of us. Uh, we hear from him from time to time. This is Danny uh, up in the uh, Sierras. So, Danny, you're in a good neck of the woods. Uh Bigfoot or not, I love that country. I, I just, uh, it's, it's a very, very beautiful country. Okay, so Danny wants to will wants to know if Will is still holding to that the Freeman footage is fake, given that after ten years since it was made by, it was made a baby Bigfoot was discovered in the film uh, by Doug Highcheck. We know who Doug is. We've had him on the show, and the same footprint was found by someone else uh, with a different timeline, a different place. So, um, Danny, thank you for the question. We like all questions. And um, I don't know, Will, what do you think? Has Have you uh, amended your position on that, that you think it's fake or uh, open to the possibility that it's legit? Or I, what, what are your thoughts? I, I think it's fake. And I'll tell you something, you know, I respect Doug, but, you know, I sent him a picture and he said it was a stump. Uh, no stump, you know, stumps don't have feet. Sorry, you didn't take a good look at it. So, you know, I, I have to question, and I've never seen a baby Bigfoot. You know, I mean, people people come up with pareidolia, and uh, I don't know if I said that right, but pareidolia, pareidolia, how do you say that, Tom? <laughs> well, I call it, oh. it, it, yeah, pareidolia. Okay. Um, pareidolia, pareidolia. Yeah, I'll, I'll go with that, sure. That's right. We're we're not perfect here, folks. So if we say something wrong, we're sorry, but uh, that's just the way it is. Um, they're seeing things that aren't there. We'll we just do put it that way. Things incorrectly. Yeah, we'll just we'll just say they they make things out of stuff that's not there. And and I get I get stuff like that all the time. And I, I understand, you know, and people who are honest, they'll they'll ask a question, what my thoughts are. And you know, I, if I don't see anything, I don't see anything. Um. If you have to, if you have to dig that hard for something in a picture, then it's really probably not there, uh, and you're not going to convince the public of it. So, um, by my opinion, me, that film is it's fake. And I think one of the reasons that you feel that the film is fake is that there's kind of a bobbing motion. That the actual movement of the creature is sort of contradictory to. <laughs> known, you know, the way they do actually move, which is a very fluid motion. That's that's part of it. Part of it is is you know kind of a cavalier attitude. If you're that close to one of these creatures, and and I don't care who you are, it's always a holy crap moment. It's not, oh, there yeah. he is. You know, let me let me get closer to him and get a better picture. Nonsense. You know, I'm calling BS on that. It turns its head too, and they don't they don't do that. Right. They have to turn their whole upper body. Exactly. You're correct on that. So, that's my opinion. You know, people can agree or disagree. That's just the and way it is. And he's sticking to it. That's right. How about the rest of you? What do you guys think? So, I'm with you. It's fake. Period. Are you asking my opinion? Chuck, what do you think? Are you asking go ahead, my opinion? Oh, yeah, go ahead, Forrest. I'm not asking my opinion. <laughs> um, I actually have seen the longer version, Will, and I'm going to respectfully, and you know I always, you know, we, you and I disagree sometimes, and and we always respect respectfully disagree, um, and I'm going to disagree with you. I, honest to God, think that it's, real footage uh, I think that that what I am seeing there is a possibly a pregnant Bigfoot and um, I think that the bobbing motion uh, uh, if you watch it real carefully she's picking up her legs 
fairly high, like she's stepping over stuff back there. But I have actually seen the longer footage, and there is an infant. She actually reaches up in the tree and pulls down. And um, so that's that's strictly my opinion, not having been there. I, you know, I wasn't there, and I can't, you know, I can't say how people are going to react yeah it, it was it's always been a oh uh poop moment when i've seen them but uh uh and i think y'all kind of been the same way too most of us kind of are but that doesn't mean that everybody's going to always react the same way so you know people react differently in different situations and and people that are in law enforcement know that because they sometimes expect people to react, uh, you know, this way or that way when somebody has <clears throat> died or been killed and then suddenly they become suspect because they're not reacting that way. Well, you know, people go into shock <laughs> and, and they sometimes don't react. I know, you know, when my grandson was murdered, I mean, we all, we didn't all burst out into tears at first. We all just kind of wandered around in a daze in the house. So, uh, you know, Nobody could believe that it happened. So, I mean, when you see things that shock you, sometimes you don't react exactly the way somebody else might react. So I think that we need to maybe take that into consideration. But, you know, like I say, I always respectfully disagree with you on, on uh, you know, I, I will never <laughs> because I, you know what? Hey, if you prove it to be otherwise, then I'll be the first to say, hey, you are absolutely totally correct. So, hey, you, know, Forrest, you know, you know that about me. <laughs> Forrest, what is, is it like the length of the arms that makes you believe it's real or the body or what is it? I was really looking more along the body and I was watching the legs and it seemed like she was really picking her legs up kind of high <clears throat> and kicking out. And and, you know, I'm not to say that that a human uh you know, I don't even remember if I, it's been a long time since I've seen that, but I actually watched the longer version of the the uh, film footage, and I don't even remember now who put it out there. It's been a couple of years ago that I looked at it. And Chuck, you and I talked about this, remember? Because I said, I actually saw, I said, you know, people had said something about an infant, an infant. And I was like, where in the heck is the infant? And then I went, oh, my gosh, there is an infant sitting up there in this tree. And she actually reaches up. And that's why I say I think it's a female. And it appears to be fairly a heavy-bodied female. So I'm thinking that uh, that she she might be, in fact, a pregnant uh, uh, female and that she was picking up and pull, she's pulling this infant out of the tree. And... <clears throat> So, uh, and then she just uh, kind of very, after she gets the infant, she very quickly goes off screen in the camera. So, uh, you know, I don't know. I wasn't there. All I can do is go by the film footage. So, uh, you know, and there's a lot of film footage that we see and we go scratch our heads. Is it real? Is it not real? Is it real? Is it not real? And, you know, who's to say? Uh, and, and like I say, if uh, somebody comes up with a better version and say, you know, you're absolutely wrong for us, then Forrest will say, you know what, I'm absolutely wrong. So, I'm always, I always leave that door open. <laughs> All right, Tim, what do we got next? All right, um, this is from Paul, and Paul's one of our Patreon supporters. Um, he has, he says, okay, here's the question. I got to, it's a little bit lengthy, so I have to kind of, um, sort of uh, distill it down to the question, but he says, he goes, I recall in an episode uh, sometime back, uh, Will, you had mentioned there was a creature that left three-toed prints, and it would be a very bad creature to encounter. Um, but you didn't provide a whole lot more information on that, and it was something that Mr. Black had mentioned. And, and I just want to throw this out there as a sort of a little bit of addition to that mr black said there's two of the three-toed creatures out there one of them had tails one did not one lived in swamps and one was a desert creature and i don't remember which one was which i don't know i don't want to know i don't want to find <laughs> out <laughs> um but anyway what what is there? Uh, what what, inf what additional information can you provide 
on the three toed creatures. Well, he's he still wants to record, and and I have to get back with him. He has some idea on how to how to record clearer without us going through all the all the hoops we have to to get the rest of his first interview out. But he's going to talk about all that stuff. But all I can say is. And he hasn't provided any real details beyond that because when we talk, he talks about so many things um, that those creatures are not from this planet. It's not right. something terrestrial. He and I. Yeah, you talked to him is, about it, it too. Is. He. Oh yeah, yeah. He gave me uh, he he gave me some interesting stories, uh, and they're very credible. And he speaks with somebody who has with authority. You know, it's not somebody who's trying to impress you or anything like that. Um, so it's it's one of those conversations when you're all done, you're you're, you're up at three o'clock in the morning <laughs> staring at the ceiling. I, I, ha- about I have to laugh. Stuff. You know, people in the comments on YouTube sometimes they'll there, there's one person that's ran uh, I don't know what the name is a couple of times, thinking that that's who Mr. Black is. They're completely wrong. I mean, I I know who he is. He's provided me. Uh, details on his background that I'm able to go out and independently verify, and I did. So we know he's 100% legitimate. Um, and there's even people that said, "Oh, it's 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 Will." No, it's not Will. Thomas talked to him. It's somebody completely different. Sorry, folks. Yeah, yeah, that's true. And going on a little bit further, he also um, he mentions the Falk monster. So in Boggy Creek, and there was, and if you could elaborate on that a little bit, there was the talk of a three-toed well, footprint. Well, in in and the film footage, you provided additional information on yeah, that. Yeah, well, when we when we it wasn't just uh, talking with Pam Pierce about that. It was there was uh, somebody that I used to be in contact with. He he may not be with us anymore because he was getting up there in years uh, when I was talking to him quite a bit. But uh, he was a friend of Charles Pierce, personal friend, and was actually there helping him make the film. And uh, he said that uh, they made a mistake in the film where there's, and I can't remember, there was somebody who found some tracks uh, and they showed, you know, videos of the, of the tracks and they said, oh, they were three-toed. When he says, no, they weren't three-toed, they were actually five-toes. That was a mistake in, um, in the video. He said there weren't any three-toed awesome. tracks there. Well, and, and Paul kind of ends his, his email. Uh, he lives in Austin, Texas, so that's a great place for us. You know where that is, don't you? Oh, yeah. Rhetorical question. And <laughs> he ends by saying he's a software developer. So, Paul, I got a question for you. Do you prefer C++, Java, or JavaScript? Send me an email. Questions at creekdevil.com. All right. Um, and that's, you know... Well, we had, well, we'll, I'll just say it. We had Lee on a lengthy discussion. This was a while back where Lee had insisted that he had a three-toed Bigfoot. You remember that? Did we talk about... Prince underneath his window? Yeah, did we talk about that with him on on the interviews we did with him? No, 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 because it turned into a uh, live, I'll just say it was a lively (laughs) conversation. (laughs) <laughs> yeah, I, I know. Animated conversation. He was always so animated, so I, I don't remember a lot of those conversations but uh, or the details. Uh, we probably did talk about that, and I told him you know, what Mr. Black said. And I don't recall what his response was, but... Well, he was adamant that it was a Bigfoot. And we don't... And we have pictures. He sent us pictures. But we don't have his permission, so we can't... Unfortunately, we can't post those either on the web page or do you remember if the tracks were three toed in those pictures or were, was it easy yeah. to see no they were they were huge and they were three toed and the thing that was creepy is they actually went underneath his window at the cabin and the cabin was in in the desert section of central oregon mm-hmm. so i'm like you know Really was hoping these things didn't live in Oregon, but well, there's like I said, there's, there's other things out there besides Bigfoot, and yeah. and apparently they're and, not from here and not very nice. So, well, 
And this is what I tell people when they ask me this question. I'm like, you know, Bigfoot keeps us plenty busy. And with what we know about Bigfoot, we could write a much bigger book on what we don't know than what we do know. It's a huge research topic. Well, and I've never had any interest in going out and delving into all these other topics. I think some of these people who do that stuff really don't know a heck of a lot about much. You know, so they, they cast the net wide and, you know, hope that something sticks. I mean, if you're, I, I you know, just having run into these things as a teenager, you know, made me question uh, my whole worldview. So that's been a 50-year pursuit now is trying to answer those questions. And every time you answer one question, you get five or six more. So um, not an obsession. It's just it's just something that bugs me, you know, when I, mm-hmm. when I can't answer questions. And it's not something I, I throw my life away for. I've run across so many people who have done that, you know, their families and relationships and all kinds of things. Renee Hinden did it. Um, you know, I could care less really it's just that it bugs me not to have those questions answered i agree with you 100 percent um i throttle back and i have to throttle back from time to time it's a riveting absorbing topic that can be an obsession um but family life my wife and my family my kids and all that is way 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 more important absolutely yeah than this topic so um but yeah, the three toed creatures, freaky. I yeah, don't know. But, what, not, but not in our wheelhouse. Not in our wheelhouse. Uh, Forrest, you haven't seen any three toed prints around your property, have you? Oh, God, no. <laughs> <laughs> that's all you'd need, right? Uh, that's, that's the last thing I need. It's like I got enough problems around here with that encountering aliens and <clears throat> this, that, and the other. But uh, what about your, your uh, tough? Uh, giants and then uh, see, you, you know see, your red haired giants like Ken DeHaar and see, all that, that bothers, stuff it's like, that bothers me that more, bothers me even more more than the three toe <laughs> things it's like okay that's a whole different area you know we don't deal with that but these things I, I don't know about that <laughs> yeah and then and then you've got all these people talking about you you know if you follow uh, uh, Linda Moulton how you've got which I, I enjoy listening to, to her I, I've always thoroughly enjoyed it and and Art Bell, my gosh, I never missed a show with him. But um, you know, uh, coast to coast. But uh, um, you know, <laughs> you start listening to that, and you think, my God, you know, I could worry myself into an early grave. You know, worrying <laughs> about all these isn't that the truth? So I choose not to think about it, and I just stay out of the the wilderness. And I, if I want to get my real uh, my real fix on in the wild, wild, uh, you know, blue wander, I, 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 I watch Fred in Alaska, you know, <laughs> so, and I just think, oh my gosh, why in the world is he out there in the middle of that? <laughs> We've got lions and tigers. Well, no lions and tigers, but, but you bears. know, the proverbial lions and tigers <laughs> and bears. Oh my, you know, <laughs> they've got an, an, any number of things that will eat you out there. So, um, you know, I, I, I didn't. I, I enjoyed camping out there with my husband, but then when he came back from that hunting trip, and they were talk, talking about that tough creature up in the wrangle, it was like he said, "I don't think I want to go hunting anymore." Uh-uh. <laughs> hey, Forrest. Funny, that's been we're the not going to let you off the hook. Two things. Number one, I want you to fill us in. You've done it in the past, but for those who haven't heard the story, I want to hear that story. What your husband saw. Then I want you to follow up with what, on a different occasion, what you and I don't remember who was with you, what you guys saw crossing the road. So, uh, is that okay with you if we if we do that? Uh, are you talking about what was crossing the road up here when I was looking for a cat? No, 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 no. The things, the hyena. Oh, oh, you're talking about up in Coeur d'Alene. Uh, okay, okay. Well, but, uh, but first, start... I want to hear about the giant that your husband oh, saw. Okay. Let's... My husband uh, decided he paid for this uh, hunting trip up in the Wrangles because they get really good trophy. I mean, these massive uh, goats and uh, sheep up there. And you can always count on the meat being clean and everything else. Uh, you know, there's no toxins or anything like that in their meat. So he was wanting to go up there on this hunt. Uh, and he paid a pretty penny to to uh, this 
to be to go on this uh, guided hunt up there in the Wrangles. Well, anyway, uh, they were having their little campfire talk, and uh, I don't remember if anybody had. He came back without anything, but he thoroughly enjoyed the trip and all that sort of stuff. So, uh, you know, it was just one of those things. Sometimes you get them, sometimes you don't. So, um, uh, he thoroughly enjoyed it, but he was like, they were sitting around the campfire. And of course, this was third hand information. So you take it for what it's worth. But there was a famous, what they were talking about, what there is a very famous uh, hunter up there. And I think, <clears throat> if I remember correctly, it's been a long time since I've been in the Anchorage airport because, as well, y'all know, I don't fly anymore after that one little experience I came in. Uh, from into the Anchorage airport. After that, I swore up and down. Uh, I would never get on another plane and I never did. So, uh, and that was back in the eighties. So anyway, they have these monster polar bears and monster, uh, brownies and, um, and various sundry other animals that this guy had shot and they're all mounted in there in the, um, uh, airport there and there's probably several other now, other ones in there now but that other people have put in there uh but <clears throat> he had he was well this it was a world-renowned hunter that uh, used to go up in the wrangles up there to get these monster sheep and monster goats well anyway he was uh you know looking for sheep and goats and had seen something moving up uh another mountain uh, going up the other side of another mountain across from him and you know it caught his attention and he focused in on that and he was just like uh totally unbelieving about what he was looking at but it was actually a human form red hair uh in skins and um you know animal skins and it appeared to be anywhere from up to 20 to 25 feet in height but the thing that was so peculiar and so disturbing about it was that it had tusks. He could actually see protruding from the bottom jaw were tusks on this thing. Uh, and I will tell you that I don't know in, in all of my <laughs> uh, human anatomy classes and anthropology classes and even uh, paleontology classes. Uh, uh, I don't recall any type of human ancestors or anything like that that ever uh, exhibited tusks. So that is a complete new one on me. And um, I mean, what do you make of something like that? And I guess anyway, he, I, I'm sure this guy probably still hunts up there, but uh, um, I have certainly haven't had any conversations with him and, but they were talking around the campfire and Casey got this, listen to this and he was just like holy crap he said can you imagine running into that and he's like going i haven't got a gun big enough to put something like that down i don't even know if an elephant gun would put something like that down um you know and of course if you listen to the stories about the kandahar giant you know it took a whole platoon of men to bring that thing down so you know and we do have on record the uh one's that uh, were out at Lovelock Cape, of course, I don't recall anybody or any of the uh, the Ute or Paiute uh, stories ever re uh, referring to them as having tusks. They were they were actually humans, and they actually still have skulls and stuff of them. And they were they were giants by what our, our standards. I mean, they were anywhere from eight feet to to eleven feet in height. So, uh, and they were red haired. So, I, I don't. I don't know what to make of the red hair. I don't know what to make. Of, I mean, I'm not making, I am not planning on any trips to the Wrangles to, uh, on an anthropological journey, journey to study these guys. So they're just going to remain, uh, you know, unknown to the, <laughs> uh, paleoanthropology, uh, people. So, you know, somebody else wants to do it, have at it, but not me. So, you know, but I just know that Casey came back and he was like, you know, I listened to those stories around the campfire and he said these guys were, they weren't making up stuff. They were very serious about talking about it. And he said it was like several of us that were newbies out there. It was like they scared the bejesus out of them. He never went back out there hunting. Never went back at all. No, I don't blame him. 
What about the uh, who was with you when the two creatures uh, briefly? What what did they look like and what was that encounter like? The creatures that walked across the road. Okay, there was just one, and it was up uh, north of Coeur d'Alene. I was getting ready to go. Uh, I wasn't too far from the Canadian border. My daughter and I were traveling back to uh, Alaska, and she was actually asleep. Uh, it was the shell. She was asleep in the back seat, and uh, I saw this, uh, and I think I told y'all the, the comical part of the, about this, uh, that uh, it walked across the... I was coming up on a, uh, you know, crest of a, a hill and I mean, it wasn't a real big hill or anything like that. So it wasn't like I was pulling a real, uh, steep grade and I had a horse trailer on and she was sleeping in the back seat and I slammed the brakes on and I probably put the horses on their nose and I, I definitely put my daughter nearly into the, the floorboard and she was kind of like coming up like, what the heck, you know? And I was like, Bigfoot, 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 and and she really didn't see it because she, like I said, she was half asleep, and I was like pointing over there, and you know, because it literally walked across the road in front of me, and the sun, it was really, it was kind of a beautiful setting because it was very dark. I'm, I say it was either dark brown or black, and the one thing that I do remember that it was the sunset was setting behind it and silhouetting it so beautifully and the the sheen coming off of the hair was almost a purple rosy purple glow <laughs> and so when i was telling her later i said i said i guess it was my purple monster and she's like oh my god mom just saw a purple people eater and so that kind of became the joke in the family. A mom, tell your story about your purple people eater, you know. So I entertain the grandkids and the great grandkids now with my purple people eater story. So y'all can laugh about that. But it did. It walked right across the road and I was yelling at her. It, it just went into the woods right there, right there, right there, you know. And uh, it was, I mean, that was my first, first encounter ever. And, uh, and gosh, that was back in the, it had to have been the late 80s, early 90s. So it was, uh, it was rather unnerving at the time, but, you know, because it was just me and her traveling. But, uh, I mean, it, it was, it was exciting, you know, it was like, oh my gosh, oh my gosh, I actually got to see one. I got to see one. So, you know, but anywho. All right, cool. All right, uh, Will Ava from Maryland uh, has, uh, uh, and I want to say thank you, Ava. Uh, you sent us three questions, questions one, two, and three. And uh, Will, do we have time for three questions? We These do, are directed yes. towards you. Yeah. Okay. Question number one is for those who go out into the field to do research, what would be the ideal scenario for you to encounter? The example she gives is if I were out there looking for one, I'd hope to find a friendly vegan Sasquatch <laughs> with no intention Sorry. of ripping me to shreds and who likes to have their picture taken. Well, that's the, the ideal comment. situation, but I, I can tell you there's basically two kinds of encounters, and I've had one of each. Um, <laughs> the first one is the one you really don't want to have, but that's the most common type, unfortunately. That's where you, you walk right into them, um, and, and you need to go change your drawers afterwards. But... Um, yeah. The second one, you know, we were in a car, there was a natural barrier between us and the creature, you know, and it, and it disappeared. Everybody saw it. It disappeared in a couple of moments, but you know, we got a look, good look at it. Um, I, I don't know that you could actually create, you know, the ideal encounter, but, uh, I, I would suggest, you know, here's the shameless plug. Uh, my latest book, which is actually my field guide, the Bigfoot, uh, survival guide that's on Amazon. Uh, get that, and that'll give you the information you need to uh, not get in a bad situation. Can, can, I, can I ask you something, Will? Sure. Because uh, uh, I want to run something past you here. Do you not find it interesting that, and maybe you know something different than me, uh, but most of these encounters where you have people 
and and Chuck knows this because he had one uh, right up there, and he was in his automobile, he was in his truck, and it came right up to the window. You remember my friend Anita had the same type of situation, and and we've heard numerous accounts of people uh, being in their vehicles and having very close up types of encounters with them, actually holding their, grabbing hold of their vehicles, and you have that mm-hmm. uh, experience too. Do you not find it unusual? that they don't try to break in, but yet you see pictures I've seen and heard of plenty of encounters with bears <clears throat> that people have bears come up to their vehicles and will have no hesitancy about trying to push in a windshield or push in a window. If they're wanting to get into that vehicle, you know, badly. And, uh, you've also, how many encounters have we heard of in, in Africa where chimpanzees will do the same thing, but yet we don't usually hear of Bigfoot doing this. Well, and now maybe you have heard of an incident, and I oh, just yeah. don't know about. It. Okay, hold on now. Yeah, I've, okay. I've I've got I've got encounters where they they did in fact uh, they've ripped off doors, they've gotten doors open, Bigfoot tracks around the vehicles, people never found again, things like that. That has happened. So what you're looking at is you're not looking at. And I think it has to be viewed from a different vantage point. When you look at the creatures across the board, now, now granted, not all of them are man-eaters, but those ones Mm -hmm. will stay far away from where people are, Uh, which is kind of disconcerting because that means the ones that are being seen are not the friendly ones. So, but as a, as a group, as a species, um, you kind of have to look at them like serial killers in a way, the ones that are bad that are doing these things that are approaching people and, and doing things. It's, it's a ramping up behavior. They're gaining, mm-hmm. they're gaining confidence through experience. So the ones that are doing things like that, they're, they're kind of testing the waters. And, and unfortunately the ones who graduate beyond those points, um, you know, that's where people are vanishing and never found again. Well, see, I just had not heard of any instances where that they, uh, had broken into vehicles, but I, I figured that probably you would be the one that would know about that I've, type of I've incident. gotten some, so. and I, I don't broadcast them because, um, you know, for the fam- for the families, but I've got several that are, are pretty creepy, and um, uh, I just won't go into that just because, you know, out of respect for the families. But, yes, it does happen. Well, they, I know that they had one incident, and I think I've related this before, um, where... Um, that and I think it happened on the Denali Highway. But if I'm if I'm wrong, and in Christmas, and he can he can certainly correct me because I know he will. Um, we talked about a couple of other instances, and I couldn't remember where it had happened. He knew exactly where what I was talking about. So, but we had heard about an incident, and I'm like I say, I think it was on the Denali Highway. But hey, folks, if I'm wrong, Fred will find out and correct me. Um, but. Uh, a gentleman pulled up on a vehicle that had um, uh, the door was open. There was blood on the snow outside the door, and uh, there was no individual in the vehicle. And uh, the door, if I remember correctly, had been pushed back to the point that it couldn't even actually be closed again. Mm-hmm. So, um, and, you know, something... And, and he actually saw something moving in the woods that was of gigantic proportions. And he got back in his vehicle very quickly and then drove to uh, a place that uh, he could report the incident. So uh, I think this occurred before we had cell phones, but I will uh, put a um, <laughs> uh, disclaimer in there because I don't know that for a fact. But in Alaska, you don't get good reception when you're out in the the wild wild so uh sometimes you have to go to the nearest uh hard line so that you can actually put in a call to law enforcement so well tom um, you know basically what he did we we know about the story we've talked about this just last week um on on prospect oregon on union creek you know what i'm talking yeah. about tom that was yeah, a yeah. situation that almost where that almost happened because the creatures were not slowing down. They were making a, a beeline right for the truck. The two men got in the truck. In fact, one of them got so close, he thinks he ran over its feet because it screeched as they peeled out of there. 
and it was right mm-hmm. up at the window. So I think had they, you know, been delayed by a few seconds, um, I'm sure the vehicle would have been broken different. into and they would have been missing. Right. And that was the question I often have. Oregon has a very high um, rate of missing people, the people that are, have vanished. You know, where SAR teams can't find them, dogs don't find them, nobody finds them. But the vehicle is found, and it's always been my question, what is the condition of the vehicle? And, you know, was the door left open? See, we're it's not, not that way. And we're not told that. Them. No, we're not. No, we're not. Um, so. Okay, let's go ahead and yeah. move on to the next right. question. We're running Moving on, time. okay. Yep. Okay. So we got two more questions. Uh, Ava wants to know: Do you? Th- what do you think they do with their dead? Well, if anything, if they do anything at all. Well, that's a good question. It's something we don't know anything about. Now, if they were to just leave them, and there are some indications that they are just left on locations. There's a couple of stories that John Green had in his books. Uh, one was, oh, what was the name of the area? It was Tom? I want to say Thompson Creek. It but it was Thompson something. It's up here in Northern California. And the story basically went that, you know, a couple of young girls, and I think they were 10 or 12 at the time, were going down, you know, a logging road, and, and they found a, a half-decomposed corpse of one of the creatures. And, of course, you know, the story didn't get out for many years, so by the time Green went there, it was probably 20 or 30 years later, and there was no sign of anything. Uh, and then there was also the... Um, um, the people who were, I want to say they were office workers or something to that effect, but they used to go prospecting on their vacations and they canoed into a place up on the uh, Western coast of Canada and British Columbia. And on the way out, they found next to a lake shore, the partially decomposed corpse of one of these creatures. And they argued about it. And it was the story where, you know, the wife snuck the jawbone into one of the packs and it sat on their mantel place for 14 years until the house burned down and was destroyed in the fire. But um, So there's those stories, but there's also stories of people seeing the creatures, you know, five or six of them with a dead member, almost like they were in mourning. And now whether they buried, and I think one of the stories indicated where the person claims they saw it, um, you know, the creatures you know, burying it or piling rocks on it or something like that. But I'd have to go back and actually see the details of the story. But, um, so it's an unknown. I mean, some may, some may not. Oh, good question. Thank you, Ava. Okay. Last question. And Ava wants to know, uh, she says, one of my family members was teasing me about my love of taking in rescued animals and said, if you came across an orphan baby Bigfoot, I bet you'd take it in. So it got me thinking, could a Bigfoot survive in captivity? Well, the only example we have was the Jacko story from 1882. And uh, they said they they couldn't keep it indoors because it would sweat profusely. uh, And it wouldn't eat much. I I think it only ate, or it it did like like raw meat, but they didn't want to give it raw meat because they didn't want it to become uh, vicious. And, uh, but it would drink milk. And, and things like that, but it wasn't eating a lot. So I, I don't know. I mean, I think it would be very difficult, you know, to try to keep one of those things, especially once it got big. Oh, well, and I'll on. just, I'll just throw you this in there. I one in your garage. <laughs> <laughs> <It's>... <laughs> don't say and that. I don't, don't think you can think of these in terms of any other animal we know i don't think they compare to anything out there i don't know what are your thoughts will no it's something very different we've talked about that many times something all its own well and you know primates uh and this is something that you see in lab animals and uh you know you 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 take uh, they you know right now uh and i know a lot of people are probably gonna uh have their comments about me about stating this, but PETA actually does some good things. Um, they right now are trying to stop the trade, and uh, and it is an illegal trade. And uh, macaques that are coming out of Indonesia, uh, especially, um, because they have no restrictions on, um, there's no restrictions on the long-tail macaques out there, so a lot of them are captured. They're not considered an endangered species, which, uh, unlike your stump tails and your pigtails are so uh 
and then uh, China exports a lot of the rhesus uh, monkeys. You hear about that in use of uh, lab work. You get these macaques. They're they're sent they're sentient, self-aware animals, and um, you lock them up in a cage. It's it's akin to locking a child up in a cage. Seriously, and um, you cannot expect them to be happy about that and then then you're poking them with all sorts of different stuff and and you know the thing that you know you talked about jacko you know wasn't there some concern about that he might have had head injuries too because didn't they conk him on the head with a big rock and they thought that maybe in fact that he'd fallen off that cliff to begin with uh where they found him uh, along that rail side well Um, in the story they actually they saw him and they pursued him up a up a rock face and one of the guys yeah. I was actually able to climb above where he was uh was perched and dropped a rock on him and then he fell down but yeah. it did knock him out yeah. yeah and i think they i think they saw you know they found him uh, when the the train went by him i actually stopped in hope when uh and we were going up the the highway there uh through the devil's gorge if you can believe that's what it's called the devil's gorge up there and you've got hope and all those different little towns up there and they actually have a story about jacko in one of the um the stores there and um i mean so it was a well-known uh an encounter and capture of this animal but they they suspected they found him they said sleeping on the side of the 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 railway there and the the i guess he was awakened when the tr- uh train went by right and then he tried scrambling up the the cliff face there and 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 so i suspect that i wonder if you know it was a it was obviously a juvenile it wasn't a full-grown one um and that he might have fallen off that cliff face to begin with so this poor thing probably was already injured uh, and, you know, may have been knocked out. I mean, you see that macaques do it all the time. Babies will fall out of the trees and, I mean, they will literally knock themselves out. And then mom rushes down there and they've got this limp baby and they're, I mean, you know, let's face it, the only thing they don't want to do is to coddle it and uh, lick it and, you know, and sometimes they're doing more damage to the baby than if they just let them lay there until they regain consciousness. You know, they don't know. They're not an EMT. They're a monkey. So, um, you know, uh, it happens. Right, it does happen right. in nature. These, these, these monkeys fall out of trees. I mean, they're not, <laughs> they're, you know, especially the infants and the juveniles, they're, they, they act just like stupid kids. I mean, how many times did y'all got probably fall out of trees and do stupid things when you were growing up that you should probably not have lived through? But anyway, you know, it happens. Right. So, well, listen. you know. I just wonder if that might have had an effect on uh, his fact. But I mean, well, there's no way of knowing because they don't they don't say that in the story, though. Yeah, there's no speculation about that. Listen, we need to wrap this. uh, We need to wrap up. We're running out of time. Um, Didn't didn't mean to cut you off there, but we are just about out of time on this piece. So, thanks for joining us, folks. Keep sending in your questions. Thanks for listening to this episode of Creek Devil. If you or anyone you know has had an encounter with these creatures, please contact us at williamjevning at yahoo.com. That's William, J-E-V-N-I-N-G at yahoo.com. All communication is confidential. Join us for another program next week. And until then, keep your eyes open out there.